Good to see you again. I want to thank uh, Pastor Willie uh, for, for preaching and my, my dad, Dr. Westlake, for preaching the last two Sundays. It's, uh, it was a great honor, and I want to thank Pastor Nicole, who's our COO, for keeping the ship running, running straight day after day. As, uh, you don't see a lot of the day-to-day. We're, we, are, we are a church about three days a week. We're a corporation seven days a week. So that's got to be run all the time. So what, what we do here and what is done behind the scenes, the two of those things together, make it happen. And I thank that whole team for uh, making this thing work. And they do so much better when I'm gone, probably. But uh, honored to have good people and, um, and good people to fill the pulpit. It's an awesome thing. Moving into a new series today, for a few weeks, we're going to talk about uh, user ID. How many of you have ever forgotten one of your user IDs? <laughs> I, it happens to me quite, quite, quite often. I will, uh, I'll try to, to log into something, and it's like, what's your user ID? And I'm like, okay. Um, and we, we usually have several that are kind of our go-tos that you try, okay, I'll try this one, try this one. But what happens when we, when we choose that user ID, and this, I find this offensive. When I choose something that has to do with something I like or my name, nobody else in the world should have it. But it shows up and it says it's already in use. And I'm just like, no, that's mine. Nobody else can have that. So then it'll give you a recommendation, like West 1862591Z12. What? I'm not taking that. So you choose something else, and you end up with a combination of uppercase and lowercase and exclamation points and dollar signs and asterisks, and that, and that becomes your user ID, and you think, oh, that's no problem. I'll remember that. Do you remember it? No. Not at all. And, and I, think, I think one of the things we deal with in the journey along the way, we, we kind of forget who we are. It's very easy to forget our, our identity and what God is creating us to be. So this user ID series is going to be that. We're going to talk a little bit about identity. It's not, it's not a gender identity thing. It's, a, it's an identity in Christ thing. So we're going to be moving that direction. And the, the overarching verse is going to be this. It's in Jeremiah 17, actually two verses. And I would encourage you to write these, these numbers down. Jeremiah 17, chapter 17. Verses 7 and 8. Write that down somewhere that you can refer to it later. Because there are several things in these two verses that I think, uh, independent from this, you might grab onto and say, hey, that, that's significant. That means something to me. Talking about who we are. Who we are and who we're destined to be. Verse 7 says this, But blessed or blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and their confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green. They retain the blessing and they never stop producing fruit. I believe that's the the ultimate ID that God is wanting us to have. That's the ultimate identity. So refer back to that, and I'll be reading that every week during this series, Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8. Today, I want to refer to a story that, uh, and, and you know, this is one of those things you're not supposed to say from the pulpit, and especially in this culture. You're, you're, not, you're advised, never say, you know, the story you may know, or as you know, or because most people don't know anymore. But this one is so common that uh, a lot of people still, I think, no pieces of it. So I will break the rules and say, many of you know this story. And it's the story of Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. You say, oh yeah, oh yeah, okay, we know that guy. There have been a lot of sermons on, on Bartimaeus. I would say definitely top five, maybe top three references Bartimaeus either in sermons or illustrations, or stories, or offering, or announcement time, uh, there's probably top three. Moses would be maybe four. David's in there. Uh, definitely, definitely top three for Bartimaeus. And we know him, we know him as not just Bartimaeus, but as blind Bartimaeus. That's who he is. 
he's not just Bartimaeus, he's, he's blind Bartimaeus. And for those of you who are, who are OGs in the crowd, you may remember back, back in the day, and it actually was the day, it's not allowed when people say back in the day and they're referencing like 2012. That's not the day. That's not the day. That's like yesterday. Back in the day is back in the day. It's got, I'm guessing it, to be back in the day, it has to be 60s, 70s, 80s might be grafted in at this point. So back in the day, some of you would go further back than that. Maybe I, we'll just leave that alone. Um, back in the day... Does anybody remember flannel boards in Sunday school? Thank you. You would go to Sunday school and have these boards there that were like a light blue, kind of a, some kind of sea foam. They call it sea foam now. Back then it was just blue or green. But you had this sea foam board and these little paper things that were Bible characters. And I remember... They had Bartimaeus, and I was the pastor's son, so I would borrow them and take them home because I thought I had rights to those. And anytime they used one in Sunday school, you wanted it. It became desirable. So here's, you know, whether it's loaves and fish or whatever, Jonah and the whale was a big, everybody wanted the whale. So Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus, I remember, and I probably had that one at home at some point, and it was probably folded in half. So blind Bartimaeus was there. It's, 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 a, it's an age-old story we refer to. And it's just that, blind Bartimaeus. So this, this is the account of that in Mark chapter 10, telling us that, yes, Bartimaeus indeed was blind. And as people would come in and out of the city of Jericho, which was a major hub of commerce in that region, as they would come out because the the beggars and those who were blind, lame, and could not take care of themselves were allowed to be sitting near the city gates or on main thoroughfares, which this would have been both near the gates on a main thoroughfare, and they were allowed to beg for money. So Bartimaeus was there, and he was blind. Now, he was a legal, he would be considered a legal beggar, which, you know, that term may not be Wonderful to say, but that's what he was in that, in that society. He was a legal beggar, which means that the government had issued an ID. You would go to the government. If you were legally blind or lame or impaired to the point of not being able to, to function normally in society, they would issue you a, a coat or a blanket. And you can call all of those things a cloak. They would issue a cloak that was actually your ID as a legal, certified, by the government, beggar. Because what, what they were begging for was more than just money. So they, that's why he would cry out to Jesus, have mercy. He said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the disciples and the people with Jesus said, stop, just quiet. He does, he's not here for you. And Bartimaeus, knowing that Jesus, his legend, the stories, what he had heard, Jesus was able to have mercy on him and help him, so he cried out even louder. He wasn't going to be dissuaded by a few people saying, no, shh, shh, quiet. He said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, what he was asking for was anything. Do you have anything that can help me? Money, alms, it could have been called. Food, healing. He wanted healing as well. So he was calling out for all of that. Have mercy on me. Do you have anything that will help me? That's what, that's what Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus, with his cloak on, was asking. Do you have anything that can help me? And if I referred to this about three weeks ago, actually Freedom Sunday, Jesus asked him, what do you want from me? And he said, I, I want to see. I want to be healed. So there were several things tied to that. So this was, this was a very structured thing. It seems very spur of the moment, but it was very structured. You probably had a line of beggars in that area. And maybe he was the only one. It doesn't say all this. Maybe he was the only one who was really yelling out for Jesus in the midst of others. Because it was by the city gate. It was on a main thoroughfare. There were probably many there. But Bartimaeus was the one that said, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. Me, Bartimaeus, I need you. 
He doesn't care about you. I'm going to make him care about me. I need you. I need you to have mercy on me. And so Jesus stopped the caravan of people and told the disciples, bring him to me. So they went to get Bartimaeus. Verse 50 in chapter 10 is one of the most incredible verses in the Bible. I love this verse. It says, Bartimaeus, when he was called to see Jesus, it says he jumped up and he threw his cloak. He jumped up and he threw his identification as a blind man. Now think about this. He doesn't know what's going to happen yet. Jesus had foreknowledge. He knows. Bartimaeus does not know. But as he jumps up, springs to his feet, or in some fashion jumped, leaped up, took his cloak. Now let me remind you, the value of this to him was was irreplaceable. This oftentimes was the only possession, maybe next to a cup to collect, but this was either the prize possession or only possession that most beggars had, and it was a government-issued ID. So Bartimaeus jumps up, and the only thing he has of any value, because if he's got a cup, it's not valuable unless people are putting things in it. So the only thing he has of value that identifies everything about him is this, and he jumps up and he throws it. And what he's saying is, I am no longer going to be that person. That is no longer going to be my identification. That is not what I'm going to be known by. That is not how I'm going to be known. That is not who I am because I'm approaching the one who can change my destiny. That's an incredible verse. Culturally, that meant a lot. Spiritually, throwing it meant even more. Three quick things to consider about identity, and this is you. Consider identity by destination, not situation. See, some of you are in a situation right now. And situations have a, have a way of rising up and growing and overtaking your destination. And you think, I'm going to be here forever. I'm going to be stuck in this place forever. I'm never going to get beyond this. The problem I'm, I'm facing now, what I'm dealing with now, what's detouring me now, I'm never going to get beyond that. And that becomes our destination. That is not your destination. Consider your identification based on the destination that God has for you, not your current situation. Your current situation does not ultimately determine your destination. I've been stuck in the mud before in a car. I've been stuck in the snow before in a car. And you have that moment where you think, I'm never going to get out. I'm never going to get out. And then suddenly the tire grips onto something. Or somebody helps you. And you get out and you think, I'm free. I was there. I thought I was never going to get out. I'm free. That's kind of what a situation is like. You might feel like you're spinning your wheels. You're never going to get out. This is going to overtake you. This is where you're going to be forever. It is not where you're going to be forever. Because God has something else for you. Your current situation is not your ultimate destination. Your identity is not tied to your current situation. Hear that. Hear that. Somebody needs to write that down and take that in. Your current situation is not your identity. Number two, consider identity by separation. Sometimes there are things you need to separate from to get your real identity. You know, they used to, they used to say, you know, whoever you, whoever you hang around with is ultimately what you become. I don't know that that's true because I think some people, some people help shape other people. Some people are easily shaped by other people. So it can go either way. But I do know this. Most of us have things in our life that we need to separate from. You have things in your life that you need to separate from because they do not pull you in the right direction. You can't get out of the grip You can't get away. You can't get free. 
because you keep hanging on. What if, what if Bartimaeus would have said, okay, I'm coming to Jesus, I'm going to jump up, but I'm going to keep my cloak because I may, be, I may need it again. He might still have been healed, but maybe not because Jesus said what to him? Your faith has made you whole. He didn't say, my power has made you whole. My disciples have made you whole. My being God and supernatural has made you whole. Nope. He said, your faith has made you whole. The only thing that Bartimaeus had done that was any faith was throwing that cloak. Sometimes you've got to separate from something. You say, well, I just, I just can't. Well, then stay in your situation. Number three, consider identity by proximity. What this is saying is move close to the right things and away from the right things. The closer you get to God, the more obvious the wrong things become. How many of you, and we won't take it any deeper than this, but how many of you since committing your life to Christ like it is now have tried to go back into a setting like you used to go in before and you, just, and you get there and you're just like, man, I can't be here. I can't do this. This is, it's not right anymore. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah, you, we, most of us try to walk back in. I remember I went to a place one time, and I thought, I just want to check this place out. I want to and I had finally committed my life to Christ strongly, and it's like, I'm going, I'm going to check this place out because I've heard so much about it. I want to stop And I was like, I, got, I was just like, man, I hate this place. I feel awful. I got to get out of here. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. Sometimes... We have to stay closer to God and move closer to God, not sometimes, all the time. And when we do, when we do, it's amazing. That's why I don't stand up here and tell you what you have to do in your life and what you don't have. You can't do this. You very rarely, if ever, hear me say, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you have to do this, you have to be like me, you have to go. No, no, no. See, I think the Holy Spirit is much better than, at that than I am. So I just try to give you, I try to give you enough God, enough of the Word, that you can sense the Spirit of God, and God will work in you. Because when you're trying to gravitate to something that you're not supposed to be around, the Spirit will let you know. When you're trying to go back into this and you're not supposed to be a part of that, the Spirit will let you know. When you're trying to sin and you really want to sin and God doesn't want you to sin anymore, the Spirit will let you know. Sometimes it will make you angry. Sometimes it will make you sin more. But the Spirit never shuts up. And you're just like, God, cannot, can't you just leave me? Just stay at the door. Let me go in here by myself without you. Let me go in this situation without you. He won't do it. He sticks closer than a brother. Get closer to God, and the other stuff will become apparent. The other stuff becomes apparent. Well, why don't you tell people how to live their life? This, it's in the Bible. Why don't you say this? Why don't you say more of this? I just want to give you God. I want to give you God, and I want to preach the Word, and I want to let God do His work in your life. It, it's not up to me to do work in your life. And that, that's, not, that's not necessarily church appropriate, but I, just, I like God's ways a whole lot better than mine. So he jumped up, and he came to Jesus, and he was healed because his faith made him whole. Three things coming into this, this, this message. I knew it wasn't a long message. I've given you all the substance I have to give you. I know it's from God for today because he prepped me ahead of time, and the Spirit has been speaking to me about this every day. And I also know we need the altar today. Because there are some identity issues that we need to work through. And God is, going to, God is going to change the ID for some of you here today. Here in the room, watching online, God is going to do something in your spirit. I know he is because he's, he's let me know ahead of time. Some of the things God has spoken to me. Your identity is so wrapped up in what you've been through or what you're going through that you can't see beyond it. You are tortured or tormented 
by what you're going through or what you've been through. And your identity is wrapped up in that, and you need, you need to be set free. Some of you so desperately need to be set free from, from what you're going through or what you've been through. Some of you, that your identity is wrapped up in abuses that you've been a part of. There's been abuse in your life. It's held on. It has determined your identity. And that voice speaks loudly to you. Some of you, it's addiction. There's, there are addictions in your life. And that is your identity. And you say, well, it's in my family. You know, my, my grandfather, my grandmother, my mom, my uncle, my aunt, my, my cousins. It's all in our family. No, God can break all of that. God wants to break all of that. Your identity is not as an addict. Your identity is as a child of God. And you can be set free from that. And your identity doesn't have to be ta- attached to that. And you say, well, you know, if you're an addict, once an addict, always an addict. You might, need that for, you might need that for a program, but spiritually speaking, when God sets you free, you are no longer an addict. You are not that anymore. Well, you're still this. No, guess what? I am not. I hate to disappoint you, but I am not that anymore. I used to be that. I am no longer that. And many of you have that testimony. Failures. Some of your identity is so attached to your failures. And some of you, some of you, it's... There is such a deficiency and hurt and shortcoming in you that titles and achievements are never enough. And I can tell you this as somebody who has, who has lived years of this. I had a very famous, well-known, highly successful father most of my adult life, no matter how many accolades I got, how much affirmation I got, what I saw when I looked in the mirror was a failure. God has finally set me free from that. But it took a lot of years. It took a lot of years and a lot of bad days. Because it's very easy to look in the mirror and see yourself as something that nobody else sees. No matter how good, no matter what people tell you, no matter how much affirmation you, you get, and you can never get enough, You look in the mirror and you see a failure. Even if you win the race, you see a loser. Some of you, that's your identity. Your identity is that. You're not good enough, and that's that's kind of what it was for me. I just never felt like I was good enough no matter what I did. And the enemy still tries to use that on me, and I still fall for it sometimes. But I know it's not the truth anymore. And some of you live in that. Some of that, that's your identity, and that will keep you bound that will keep you bound, it will keep you unhappy. So some of you are dealing with that. Some of you are dealing with identities that you've had since your childhood. Things were thrust on you, you were given an identity. Maybe you're dealing with what people have said about you. Your identity is not what people say about you. Your identity is not what people see. Your identity is who you are in Christ and who you are becoming. Because once you throw that coat away, once you throw that cloak away, and you move towards Jesus, your identity begins to change. And it can take a long time, but you end up being a new person. Old things do pass away, and all things do become new. And identity is part of that. Some of you, what you're in right now is so heavy and so intense, that's all you see every day, and it weighs on you. And like I said, the the, the car in the mud, you feel like it's never going to happen. I'm never going to move away from this. You are. The enemy is a liar. The enemy will lie to you every day. The enemy will lie to you every time you pray. The enemy will try to lead you in different directions. But God is your ultimate destination. And without breaking it down into any categories, subcategories by invitation, some of you need to come to the altar today. And it's an ID thing. It's an identity thing. 
You say, you're talking to me, Pastor. Whatever I said, any of those areas and maybe something else, but you know I am speaking to you right now. You need to commit this to God and give God a chance today to change your identity, to do some repair work in your heart and in your mind and in your emotion. Some of you need to move forward to the altar and be a part of this. So begin to move out. You say, that's me, that's me. I I need identity to happen. I need a change. I need a renewal. I need God to do his work in my heart, my life. I need that to happen for me today because I know this for a fact. When God speaks to me in this way, so directly and so specific, I know he has specific things for specific people. And some of you have been hampered your entire life by a false identity that somebody else or some other situation gave you. And I know God can set you free. You say, well, I prayed about it before. God can set you free. I've given it to God before. God can set you free. I've tried to throw the cloak away before. God can set you free. Because in the moment, in the moment that Jesus says, come to me, bring him to me. In the moment Jesus says, come to me, and we move toward him, something happens. Something happens, and God begins to move in the supernatural. If you're watching online, just focus. Lock yourself in to some, to some isolated area of the room. Focus on God and allow Him to speak to you. Identity is such a huge thing. See, in biblical times, the coats they wore, the cloaks they wore, the robes they wore were significant of everything. Everything. The woman with the issue of blood to try to touch just the, it says the tassels on the bottom of Jesus' Levitical robe. It symbolized things. So his cloak symbolized this person is blind. This person is deficient. This person is a beggar. And the enemy will try and try and try to convince you that's who you are. That's who you are. You don't matter. You're not enough. Some of you, like me, have lived for years and felt like no matter what you did, you were not good enough. And you guess what? The truth is you're not. But God makes up the difference. And he'll do that for you. God will make up the difference. He's able. So I'm just going to pray. I'm not going to ask you to pray the prayer that I'm praying. But in your own words, in your own verbiage, just ask God, to give you a new identity, new spirit, renewal, whatever words you want to use, give you something new, make you new, give you a new direction, change your destiny, need a user, a new user ID, whatever you want to say to God, He knows your heart, He knows why you're standing here. And I know God's going to meet people's needs. I honestly know in my heart that there are going to be some of you who are going to walk away from this morning And the same thing in the first service, you're going to walk away from this day and something's going to be different. It's going to happen for you this time. I know that in my heart. God's going to renew some minds and hearts. And I really want that for you. I really want that for you today. So I'm going to pray over you and just give it to God. In your own words, give it to God. Don't worry about anything or anybody around you. Just give it to God. Heavenly Father, we need you today. We struggle so much with who we are and what's happened to us and what we're in the middle of and what we're going through. And the enemy and culture and things around us help us focus just on that. So we end up seeing ourselves oftentimes as something we're not or less than we are. God, you have given us a relationship with you. You called us. You knew who we were before you called us. You knew our struggles before you called us. You knew our weaknesses before you called us. You knew our strengths before you called us. And you still called our name. You still drew us to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I ask you today to renew our minds, renew our hearts, give new identification, give new identity, God. Remove some of the stains, remove some of the hurt, remove some of the frustration, remove some of the pain, remove even memories if that's possible for people where it's needed. Remove things that have been blockades and have caused false identities to hang on like a robe that we can't take off. God, I pray that you would do something fresh, something new, something powerful, something life-changing in everyone's heart, in everyone's emotion, in everyone's mind, and the pathway in front of them. 
those who are in the room and those who are listening and watching. Do your work, God. Do your work in people's lives and allow us to experience new, new identity in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God a hand. Let's give God an ovation. You say, well, how can it all change? You know, how can it all change? Probably within 90 seconds for Bartimaeus, through the robe, walk to Jesus. What do you need? I want to be healed. Boom, you're healed. You have sight. I bet that took 90 seconds. God can change everything. And, and you don't need physical sight today, but a lot of us need spiritual sight in the room today. You need something different. You need a new outlook. God can do that just by invitation, by the fact that we move toward Him when He calls us. And that's what the altar is. You know, to me, the altar is the most valuable thing in this auditorium, in this building. If we can't have an altar, we don't need a church. As the altar is where, is where things are sacrificed, God calls us to, and I know the last couple years we've had to be very cognizant and have been, but sometimes we just have to get to an altar. We have to get to an altar and give it to God. So thank you for being willing to move today. Thank you for being willing to trust God's Word and the draw of the Holy Spirit in your heart. And God can do it for you. I'll advise you this. Not everybody loves when I say this, but I like to speak in real terms. My feeling is the enemy will come for you with his lies as soon as you hit the door. That's what he does to me. Maybe I'm unique, but he's after me quickly, usually before I get to the door. Like right now, if I was you, he'd be working on me right now. So when that happens, figure out what you're going to do because the enemy is going to come and try to steal what God's done for you today. He's going to try to take that back and say, no, you're still, you're still the same. That didn't change anything. You've prayed before. Whatever. The enemy is, is full of that stuff. So he's going to come for you that way. But what you have is you have on your side the redeeming power of God. So decide now what you're going to say. Decide now what you're going to claim. No, God has made me new. God has changed my ID. Uh, maybe you just want to say amen, so be it. When the enemy comes and starts talking to you, amen, amen. You're a liar, devil, amen. I'm not buying it, amen, so be it. I don't say amen a lot in life, but sometimes it works. Amen, so be it. But I try to, I try to tell when the enemy comes after me and I'm aware of it and I'm paying attention, I try to tell him no, 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 I will talk out loud. No, 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 not going to do it. I'm not falling for that. No, not going to happen. So when, when it comes to you with this stuff today and tomorrow and by Wednesday, it's on heavy. So by Wednesday, you won't even, you won't even really, you know, I did, was I in church Sunday? I don't even remember. So just know that you've got victory. Maybe that's it. I've got victory. Nope, I'm walking in victory. I am walking in victory. I'm walking in victory. And if you have to say it out loud so you can hear yourself say it, say it. If you have to go get a tattoo so you can read it, go get it. I'm walking in victory. It's going to happen. I encourage you to be people of God. Treat people with love and respect and equity. Be people who are just and merciful. Uh, watch people's back and make sure you know who's behind you at all times. But uh, love God and love people. Make a difference. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here today.